Baruchim Aboyim. We are, uh, the lecture tonight is on punishment. We had talked about sin, we had talked about guilt. Tonight we're going to talk about punishment. And, and punishment is really different in a secular society than it is in a religious concept. Uh, in a secular society, when someone is punished, he's paying a debt to society. And uh, it doesn't necessarily make him better. The only regret he has is he got caught. Uh, what if he didn't get caught? Great. No matter what the crime is, as little as speeding, you know, when we don't get stopped by a policeman, not we go home and, you know, bemoan the fact that I was doing, you know, 70 and a 50 and nobody stopped me, or worse. Um, someone steals something and they get away with it, they feel good. It's a high. I'm sure O.J. walked away feeling like a, you know, a real superstar that he was able to beat the system. Religiously, punishment is to correct our actions and to give us a better connection to our soul and to God. It's a totally different concept. Totally different. Secular law is punitive. Religious law is preventative to stop us from doing things wrong. In fact, it's interesting. There's three ways to serve God. One out of fear, out of love, and out of awe. And you really need fear and love or love and awe, two wings of a bird, to balance it off. But most of us serve God and most of us do things, even in a, even in a secular society, for fear of punishment. We think that there's going to be either a policeman around the corner or a day of judgment where we'll be punished for the sins that we do and therefore we don't do things, or we try to regret what we've done before because of that. In fact, the Torah states that there's two rewards, one's for a thousand generations for doing a mitzvah, and one's for two thousand. The difference, one's done out of fear, that's a thousand, and one's done out of love. No comparison. It's twice the reward for something done out of love. In fact, the Day of Atonement um, that we have every year, Yom Kippur, it's called Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. It should be called, that's plural, it should be called Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonement, singular. Why Yom HaKippurim, plural? And the answer is because there's two types of level of tshuva, one of fear and one of love. And when someone amazingly, which doesn't exist in this secular world, when someone does tshuva, when someone repents, and doesn't even have to be punished. Out of fear, the sin can be forgiven, but it still remains, much like going to court. But there is an amazing concept of called tshuva me'ava, repentance from love, which not only takes that sin and changes it and wipes it away, it turns it into a mitzvah. An amazing concept. Now, when God punishes us, he really doesn't punish us. He punishes us the way a father punishes a child. It's called tough love. Ch a, pa a parent doesn't hit a child or give a child some sort of punishment because he doesn't love the child. Just the opposite. If you don't love the child, you, well, who cares? Let him do whatever he wants. It's done because he cares. Remember, I spanked my son. First time I ever spanked him, I went into a room and I cried. It's not easy for a parent to do. In fact, the biggest problem parents have today is they try to be friends instead of being parents. And that means doing the tough thing. And that's what God does. It's difficult for God to punish us. But that punishment has a positive spin to it. For example, when God punished the Jews in the desert, and he made them wander in the desert for 40 years, that was their punishment. Number one is it says, Yom, uh, yom, sh sh yom Shana. I want every day for a, it would be a year and they're wandering. They should have wandered for 160 years. Should have taken the, the spies 160 days to travel all of Israel. God made a miracle and they only took 40. So therefore the punishment would only be 40 instead of 160. And think about it. What was their punishment? Their punishment was instead of going into Israel right away and becoming farmers and spreading out and not being able to study Torah, to build that basis of the, what they had in the desert, which was the Garden of Eden. All their needs were taken care of. They lived off the heavenly food. They had Moshe and Aaron as teachers. They, had, they, had, they were surrounded by the clouds of glory. They had the well of Miriam. Every place they stopped was an oasis. 
It was a garden for 40 years. And they were able to study the book to become the people of the book. Without that punishment, they never would have reached the level that they needed to for us to be who we are today. That was the punishment that God gave to the nation of Israel. And think about the plagues in Egypt. We call them the ten plagues. But really it's blood, frogs, lice. On the tenth plague it's called Makos Bechoros, the plague of the firstborn. The rest of them are not called Makos. They're not called a plague. Not only that, we have a concept in Judaism that when someone, when a person, evil person is being punished, if you, unless you have merit, you can't see it. You can't watch it. So with Noah, there's a question, was he righteous or not? And in the ark, there was either a window, if he was righteous, so he could see the punishment of the generation. Or some say a door, if he was lacking and could not watch. Lot's wife, when she turned around, to see the destruction of Sodom, she turned into a pillar of salt because she did not have the merit to see the destruction that were saved in the merit of Abraham. So, we see for the first nine plagues in Egypt, no place does it say the Jews were told to be sequestered, that they should stay in their houses and not walk around as these nine first plagues were being done because they really weren't plagues. What they were was punitive, punishment in a sense, but to make the Egyptians do repent, to become better, to find God. And when they didn't, after nine, then they had the plague of Makos Bechorus, of the smiting of the firstborn. And then the Jews were sequestered, because they did not have the, the merit to be able to watch the Egyptians being punished, being killed. So the first nine, quote, plagues were really constructive and instructive in the sense of trying to get the Egyptians to do what they were supposed to do. A Mitzor, a leper, someone who speaks about other people. What's his punishment? He's put into solitary confinement. Why? So he will suffer the same end that he gave, made other people suffer when he made a rift between people by tailbearing. And that punishment is what makes him repent because he's alone and he realizes what he caused. Without that punishment, he would never have done tshuva, he would never repent it. So it is the punishment that brings him to the level of him repenting and doing what he needs to do. Because God does not want to punish the sinner. What he wants to do is remove the sin. Why is that important? That's important because, as I've mentioned many times, there is no such thing as hell for most people. It's for the abject evil, people who get other people to sin. So what is purgatory about? Purgatory is about you come into this world with a soul that's perfectly clean, pure white. And when you sin, what you do is you put a blemish on that soul. And when you come to the next world, you're going to have an audience with God Almighty, the King of Kings. And you don't want to stand in front of Him with all of these dirty stains on your soul. So much like someone who has cancer, goes through all of the pain so that he can live longer. And he's willing to go through that pain to be able to live. When we die, before we stand before God Almighty, we go through that chemotherapy of removing all the stains of sins that we've done in this world so that we have a clean soul to stand before God. But God gives us a chance. He says, why do that? Why go through the chemo? Why not go through this world and change all those things that you did and I'm going to give you wake-up calls, what we call punishments, to make you realize you've done something wrong so you can change it, so you can have regret, so you can do tshuva, so you can be a better person, so you can do tshuva, tshuva is tush of hay. Go back to the source, back to God. We as Jews don't believe in turning over a new leaf. We're perfect as we are. We need to go back to that. And that becomes the key. So God isn't punishing us. God is giving us tough love, a wake-up call for us to connect to that source of godliness so that when we come to the next world we have much less stains that we have to take care of and hopefully none so that our soul is pure and we can stand before God Almighty but if there's any cleaning that to be done it should be gentle and easy and that's why every year he gives us an opportunity Yom Kippurim to do tshuva, to repent and that's why things happen in our lives and we connect to it and realize why is it that my, I'm having trouble with my teeth. Maybe a person needs to think that he's speaking badly. 
or anything else that happens to be a wake-up call where God's trying to shake you a bit like a parent and to make you understand that maybe you need to correct something in the hope that when you get to the next world that you won't need chemo and if you do it'll be easier and quicker and that's the only purgatory it's something we would volunteer for it's amazing the, it's the time when we're saying Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers Pirkei Avot begins with the first mission, an introduction and it says, Kol Yisrael yesh lahem the olam hapa. Every Jew has a portion to the world to come. Who's that said to? And that's from the a Mishnah in Sanhedrin, in the Talmud. It is said by the head of the Jewish court to a murderer before he's put to death. And the, and the, the head of the court says to this murderer, Con son, please confess your sin, do tshuva. And even you have a portion in the world to come. Because again, the whole idea is not for God. God does not want to eradicate the person. He wants to eradicate the sin. And that becomes the essence of everything. You get away with nothing. When someone is punished by the Jewish court, it is a blessing. Because that helps remove the sin. The sin is no longer in existence. So when that person is put to death, he goes to the next world with a free soul from that sin. When someone gets away with something, when he's not caught, it's the worst thing that can happen to him. Because in this world it's cheap dollars, in the next world it's expensive dollars. So it seems to be a negative in this world, is a positive for the next world. So when a person is reprimanded, when a person finds that he's caught with something and he has to do tshuva, that's the best thing that can happen. In fact, we see, what do we see in the Shmon Esra? Who is God? We say, We hit our chest in the uh, fifth blessing in the Shemon Esri, the standing prayer. We say the word slach three times with the word Father. We say, once, forgiveness. Salach means to pardon. Salach means to forgive. Machal means to pardon. A king pardons. A father forgives. What God wants as a father is to forgive us. What God wants as a father is to be able to get us to the point Hanun Hamar that God with, with graciousness wants us to, to He wants to forgive, as every father does. No father wants to punish a child, but if he doesn't, spare the spare the rod and spoil the child. And God gives us a real example of being parents. Not only that, in the bracha, Hashivenu to return our judges as before. What do we say? We tell God to reign over us Himself. We know that we can't stand up to a court of law. We know that if we're judged in the heavenly court, we will be judged guilty. So we pray and beg God, take us into your quarters. The judge by Himself. Let you, Levadcha, by yourself. And then what do we say? How should God judge us? The chesed, with kindness. Rachamim, mercy, betzedek, and with righteousness, and then uvemishba, then judgment, because he's our father. So we throw ourselves in the mercy of our father, and everything's connected with that. So the punishment that God gives us in this world is a blessing. Every pain you feel, every difficulty you have, every every thing that seems to be out of whack, is a wake up call from God, trying to get you to become better to pay with cheap dollars in this world. So when you get to the next world, the stains that you have to go through, my father was a spotter. After things were cleaned, he would look in any spots that weren't there, there were special harsh chemicals that were used to take out deep spots. We don't want to be that. We want to go through an easy cleaning. We want to be able to stand before our father, our king, God Almighty, with a pure soul, with a clean soul, with as little difficulty as possible, and not have to go to the chemo that people go through in this world that we see. But even those that go through the chemo in this world, it's a blessing if they use it and take that pain in a positive way to repent to God and come closer. Not to pay the debt, but to become a better person and realize the flaws that we have. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a good Shabbos. And hopefully we'll all have white souls.